killing me. You're cutting into my time already. But uh, I always believe in ending on a high note, so maybe we just end it right there. But I have some important comments to make. And first of all, I'd like to recognize Ambassador Campbell and thank you for being here in the work that we're doing in Central America today. Uh, Congressman Graves, thank you for joining us here as well. Our delegation from Alaska, uh, we spooled this weather up just on your account. Uh, and also, we're, we're honored to have the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Michael Botticelli. Mike, good to see you here as well. Uh, also, our retired flag and SES Corps, and we're going to have a separate meeting tomorrow uh, to hear from you uh, how the Coast Guard is doing from the outside looking in as we share with you how things are going from the inside looking out. And you'll hear from our senior executive and flag corps as well, and all of you honor me by being here today as well. And today the Coast Guard is standing watch on seven continents across the world. And so for those of you standing the watch in our Coast Guard, these remarks are destined for you as well. Thank you for standing the watch, and it's my honor as your commandant to serve you as you serve our nation today. Now before I get into my remarks, uh, many of you have been following what's happening with a continuing resolution in our federal government. And trust me, we're keeping a close eye on that. This is not the first time that our service has found ourselves in a continuing resolution. Uh, we have members, uh, senior executive service representatives from our department, from our components in DHS. Uh, and we will get through this. I am very optimistic. And the first thing everyone wants to know is, well, what happens on Friday? You get paid. Whether you're active, retired, or civilian, you will get paid. And I am very optimistic that we will get through this. And that is not the focus of my remarks today, uh, because that is a very near-term crisis. And what I want to share with you is the long-range view, the strategic view as we look at the state of the Coast Guard in the 21st century. Before I go there, it would be instructive for me to first start with a chapter out of our Coast Guard history. And this really dates back to our first commandant 100 years ago. That was Ellsworth Bertoff. He was sworn in as our first commandant back in 1915. And at this point in time, there was an economic and efficiency act that was being studied uh, to look at savings within the federal government to combine the services of the Life Saving Service, the Revenue Cutter Service, the Lighthouse Bureau. And at this point in time, many don't realize how close we came to not being a Coast Guard. Under this efficiency and economic study, as they're looking for a $1 million annual savings, it was thought we could get rid of the United States Coast Guard or the three bureaus that were merged to form today's Coast Guard for, again, a savings of $1 million. However, this effort, when you took a look at it, was going to cost the federal government 50 percent more to accomplish the missions of the Coast Guard elsewhere in our federal government. The Commission concluded that without a Coast Guard, the Department of Treasury, Justice, Interior, Agriculture, Commerce, and Labor would have to acquire maritime capabilities, and the Navy would have to reposition ships for search and rescue operations. It was neither efficient nor was it economic. Commandant Bertoff proved 100 years ago that the Coast Guard is the most effective, economic, and efficient service to carry out inherently governmental operations across a wide array of missions. And he knew that this highly skilled team of professional mariners was indispensable to achieving national maritime objectives. So hold that thought for a minute. This being my first State of the Coast Guard address, I'm going to begin by talking about extraordinary people serving our nation today in the United States Coast Guard. That's our 88,000 active duty, reserve, civilian, and all volunteer auxiliary. And you heard some of that from Mass Chief Petty Officer Cantrell. These are men and women serving on all seven continents today, ensuring safety, security, and economic prosperity of our nation's waters and maritime interests are being met on all corners of the earth. Now, I recently had the pleasure of meeting 
Petty Officer Rebecca Templeton. She serves at Joint Interagency Task Force South in Key West, Florida. Rebecca is a tactical action officer. She's responsible for monitoring 42 million square miles of ocean. That's 10 times the size of the United States. Now what Rebecca does is she connects the dots between operational intelligence and tactical assets. And her efforts have led to the interdiction of over 300 narcotic shipments, seizing over 140 vessels. And in her spare time, Rebecca's almost completed her master's degree in criminal justice. Rebecca is a shining example of our 21st century workforce. And down in Texas City, I met with Chief Warrant Officer Michael Treblecock. Now, Michael is a maritime casualty investigator. He's widely known for his professionalism, his analytical skill, and expertise in investigating maritime mishaps, like the collision that happened this past fall between a towing and a merchant vessel. It is his thorough investigation that determined the underlying cause and identified best practices to prevent similar incidents at a point in time where our maritime transportation system is the most congested it's been in my nearly four decades of service. And I also met with our aviators who serve at our helicopter interdiction squadron, or as we know as HITRON. Their 46 interdictions in 2014 set a new record. And these 46 interdictions, almost all of them happen at night in perilous conditions. And on a single deployment aboard Coast Guard Cutter Boutwell this past summer, the Hitron crew of Lieutenant Zach Fuentes, Mike Owen, and Petty Officers David Ruiz and Mark Trice made five interdictions, leading to the arrest of 10 narco traffickers and the removal of over 5,000 pounds of pure uncut cocaine. Further, Last fall, I met rescue swimmer Corey Fix at a Coast Guard Foundation dinner in the Bay Area. Now, Corey Fix was being honored for saving 13 lives this past year. All these people were in danger of being swept into the rocky cliffs of Northern California. Corey jumped from a perfectly good helicopter into a raging sea so that others may live. When asked to make a few remarks as he was being recognized at this dinner, as he stepped up to the podium, his exact words, this is what I'm trained to do, and I had duty that day. And he walks off the stage. <laughs> talk about the champion of the understatement, but talk about humility and service before self. That is the 21st century Coast Guard of today, and I could not be more proud to be part of this great organization. These are, thank you. These are just a few of the many talented people serving our nation as I speak. It's why the 88,000 people serving in the Coast Guard today are by far the best in our 225 year history. It is because of our people that the state of our Coast Guard is strong. But I am concerned. I'm concerned that aging platforms and crumbling infrastructure continue to hinder mission success. And you have heard this mes message before. Trust me, this is not a case of neglect. The people who run our operations, our mission support enterprises, have demonstrated exceptional commitment and innovation to sustain a medium endurance cutter fleet that has served our nation for more than half a century. While some of our shore infrastructure is nearing the full century mark, and quite honestly, are on the archives of historical landmarks. Yes, today we are conducting 21st century operations from veritable museums. Now, how did we get here? It's a case of resources. Regrettably, we have lost nearly 40% of our acquisition budget over the last four years. When you look at our foreshore infrastructure, we have $40 million a year 
to buy down a $1.4 billion debt in needed shore infrastructure. This is analogous to making the minimum payment due on a credit card, and quite honestly, this bill is growing at a faster rate than we're paying. So on my watch, we are not going to be able to get out of this debt. At the same time, as we've seen before, there has never been a greater demand for the Coast Guard services on a global scale. When is the last time we encountered a new ocean? We're certainly seeing that in the Arctic today. When is the last time that much of Central America was on the cusp of instability? Unstable because of unchecked transnational organized crime, fueled by drug demand in this nation. And drug cartels whose greatest fiscal challenge is laundering bulk cash from their ill-gotten gains. I don't have those challenges. When is the last time the U.S. led the world in oil and gas production and transported much of that oil and gas by sea? In what domain has affected industry or government like cyber? Never in our history have four such growth areas on the Coast Guard converged on the Coast Guard at the same time. Now think of the aftermath of Exxon Valdez and the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, or 9-11 and the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002 that created the Department of Homeland Security. These were seminal events that reshaped the Coast Guard and we spent 10 years transforming. Today, we're seeing significant increase in demand across all of our daily activities and it limits our ability to respond to major contingencies. Indeed, we are facing a time like none other in our nearly 225 years of service. Unfortunately, this is not the first time the Coast Guard has found itself at the confluence of increasing demand for services and a flatlined or worse, decremental budget. It was in the late 1990s the Coast Guard faced significant budget challenges while demand for services remained steady. The resulting wear and tear was so dire in 1999 that one of my predecessors and my mentors, Admiral James Loy, our commandant at that time referred to Coast Guard readiness as a dull knife. In fact, the Coast Guard nearly broke under the strain. So yes, we've embarked upon this course before. Today, the knife is not yet dull, but we are cutting at a fast and furious pace with no whetstone to sharpen that edge. Last year, I sent four 210-foot cutters to costly emergency dry dock availabilities and lost 20% of my planned underway days due to unscheduled maintenance. So yes, the Coast Guard today is once again under heavy strain. But make no mistake, I will take decisive action to alleviate this strain. We will not do more with less. Those days are now behind us. We will have to make tough decisions and trade-offs, and I am committed to ensuring that our budget priorities are in perfect alignment and driven by a Coast Guard strategy that aligns with our national priorities. Also to ensure that our people have the platforms they need to serve our nation now and well into the future. Our extraordinary people deserve America's investment in a 21st century Coast Guard and I'm going to discuss our strategy to do the following. First, we're going to disrupt networks in the Western Hemisphere. Second, we will safeguard commerce. Third, we will address cyber threats to our maritime industry. And fourth, we will meet the demands of increased human activity in the Arctic. So let me first start by talking about our strategy for the Western Hemisphere that I signed out this past fall. In October, Coast Guard Cutter Boutwell, a 46-year-old high-endurance cutter, returned from a 90-day patrol in the Eastern Pacific. On her flight deck was 28,000 pounds of pure cocaine with a street value of more than half a billion dollars. This was the result of 18 interdictions by whole of government United States forces over a three-month period. 
Now, coincidentally, during the same three-month period, 68,000 unaccompanied minors crossed the southwest border. So you may ask yourself, what do these two events have in common? Let me share with you. Eight out of 10 of the most violent nations in the world today are in our hemisphere, are in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, the murder rate in Honduras is higher today than it was at the height of the insurgency in Iraq in 2007. The unaccompanied minor crisis of last summer was a symptom of a more insidious problem. Many Central American nations are gripped by 40% unemployment, 50% poverty, and widespread violence that forces parents to send their children away to a safe haven such as the United States. And they send them alone, but in the hands of a human trafficker, in a desperate race for their next generation to survive. Yes, illegal trade in drugs, people, and weapons is a $750 billion global criminal enterprise. When I meet with Central American leaders, I hear the same refrain. Organized crime is undermining governance, rule of law, and in many cases, their citizens have the misfortune of living along the drug corridor and become collateral damage to our nation's 400 metric ton demand for cocaine. Since 9-11, 450,000, yes, 450,000 Americans, U.S. citizens, have died in this country from drug use and drug violence. The impact of transnational organized crime on our homeland is profound. In addition, in response to ISIL, Ukraine, North Korea, and events like Ebola, our Department of Defense is rebalancing to answer alarms across the globe. Our sister armed services have no room whatsoever for miscalculation in what I see as one of the most complex geostrategic environments in modern history. So for all of these reasons, I am laser focused on the Western Hemisphere. And I am committed to combating transnational criminal organizations where they are most vulnerable, on Coast Guard turf, at sea. Now, defeating organized crime requires an offensive strategy, one that targets, attacks, and disrupts criminal networks. And we will do this through intelligence-based operations and a persistent offshore presence. When we identify a target, have a flight deck equipped cutter, and an aviation use of force package on that flight deck, and a highly trained boarding team, our chance of interdiction is nearly 100%. And I really like those odds. Today we have actual intelligence on 90% of known maritime drug movements in the Eastern Pacific and in the Caribbean. 90% awareness. And it's thanks to people like Rebecca at Jihad of South. However, we have too few surface and air assets to patrol the vast expanses of this transit zone. They can only attempt to detect and disrupt 20% of that known flow. So let's hold that for a minute. Think of a 911 call coming in, and you get 90% connectivity on those 911 calls, but you only dispatch to 20%. That is the dilemma that we find ourselves in today. So you can do the math. This is clearly an issue of capacity. So what are we doing? To close that gap, we have four specific initiatives to combat criminal networks. First, we have increased offshore presence to interdict drugs at sea. In fact, as a result of this increase, in the first two months of 2015, we have interdicted more drugs in the Eastern Pacific than we did in all of 2013 when we were operating under sequestration. That's a game changer for us. Second, we will continue to build upon our 41 international drug agreements. And we will work with our Department of State and with all of the interagency partners, our international partners, to grow partner nation capacity. It takes a network to defeat a network. 
The Coast Guard cannot do this alone. And third, we will fully support Secretary Johnson's vision for unity of effort and the De Department of Homeland Security task forces to secure American southern borders and its approaches. Uh, today, Vice Admiral Dean Lee, our Atlantic Area Commander, uh, wears a third hat as the Commander of Task Force East, and he is standing the watch as we speak. Actually, he's empowered others to stand the watch so he could be with us here today. But he will be <laughs> at full operational capability uh, later this year, and we have attained unity of effort within our Department of Homeland Security. This is a significant milestone. We did not have jointness within our armed services until 1986 with the passage of the Goldwater-Nichols Act. Uh, so in a very short time frame, the Department of Homeland Security has arrived at jointness, uh, and you'll see that through the creation and now the implementation of our Joint Task Forces East, West, and a Joint Task Force for Investigation, uh, with members of the interagency across DHS plugged in to each and every one of these task forces. And fourth, and probably most importantly, we will invest in an affordable offshore patrol cutter to replace our medium endurance cutters, recapitalizing the medium endurance cutter fleet is my number one priority. If you take nothing else away from the State of the Coast Guard address, my strategy can be summarized in four words, affordable offshore patrol cutter. Now, by the time we begin laying the keel for the first offshore patrol cutter, some of our legacy assets will be over 55 years old. Yes, we're seeing third generation Coasties serve on these platforms today. These ships are well beyond their intended lifespan and they are compromising the safety of our most valuable cargo, our people. The offshore patrol cutter will be the backbone of Coast Guard offshore presence and it will be the manifestation of our at-sea authorities, and they're extensive. It is essential to stopping smugglers at sea, for interdicting undocumented migrants and rescuing people, enforcing fishery laws and treaties, and protecting our ports. The offshore patrol cutter is a key element of our Western Hemisphere strategy, and I sincerely appreciate Secretary Johnson's stalwart support for this vital national S asset. And I look forward to working with the department, the administration, and the 114th Congress to bring the offshore patrol cutter to our Coast Guard fleet and to our nation. I'm going to shift to our second area of emphasis. And let me spend a moment on the Coast Guard's role in the America Energy Renaissance. I recently visited a liquefied natural gas facility in Louisiana. It's, it's under construction as I speak. When it begins operating at full operating capacity, it will produce more LNG for export than the today's world shipping fleet can carry. So think about that for a minute. This comes at a time with the expansion of the Panama Canal, which will accommodate such shipping to serve a growing demand for market in the Asia Pacific region and it will actually recalibrate our foreign trade balance. Today, the United States is the world's largest producer of natural gas and crude oil. Industry is predicting that domestic energy production will exceed consumption by 2020. Yes, we become a net export in the next six years or less. Now, why is this significant to me? Because much of that oil and gas moves on our nation's maritime transportation system. It's a system that already contributes over 650 billion dollars a year to the nation's gross domestic product and it sustains more than 13 million jobs. Yes, the safety and security of our waterways are foundational to U.S. economic prosperity. The energy renaissance is far more than the minute-to-minute -minute price of oil. For the Coast Guard, it's about how we manage, how we safeguard, how we regulate maritime activity and facilitate commerce and ultimately our nation's economic security. Today we're seeing a rebirth in the U.S. flag fleet. Fifteen LNG ships are on order to U.S. companies and they will fly the flag of the United States. In 2013, a new tank barge was launched every day, a 29 percent increase over 2012. 
and we're seeing a tenfold increase in the flow of oil and gas on the Mississippi River than we did just four years ago. And those numbers will continue to increase. So the Coast Guard will continue to monitor these trends closely because we inspect, certify, regulate, and safeguard those U.S. flagships and their crews. We mark the waterways with aids to navigation, we protect the environment, and we keep the channels free of ice. As a maritime regulator, it is imperative we engage and keep pace with industry. The Coast Guard will facilitate commerce. We will not impede it. And we also have a statutory role to ensure the maritime transportation system is secure and resilient. This includes working with industry, as we are today, to protect maritime operators and facilities from a cyber-related threat. To meet this increasing demand, on the maritime transportation system, I'm taking the following steps. First, I've directed the Vice Commandant to undertake a service-wide effort to revitalize our marine safety enterprise with particular focus on marine inspection and our regulatory framework. Second, we will increase proficiency of our marine safety workforce, and we will continue to train new marine inspectors, adding to the more than 500 that have entered our workforce since 2008. Third, I am directing investments in innovative technology to improve waterways management and the aids to navigation system. And fourth, in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security, I will soon sign a Coast Guard cyber strategy. It will articulate the Coast Guard's plan, roles, and missions for protecting critical maritime infrastructure. So that's two. Number three of these converging demands on the Coast Guard, and this is shifting to the far north and to the far south. The Coast Guard has been present in the polar regions since Seward's Folly of 1867, and since the days of, some of you may recall, hell-roaring Mike Healy on the Revenue Cutter Bear. I served on that ship, but it was several generations later. Uh, today, the recently reactivated and 39-year-old Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star just completed Operation Deep Freeze in, in Antarctica, breaking the sole channel to allow the resupply of the U.S. base of operations in McMurdo Sound. That vital mission has enabled the United States to conduct scientific research and to uphold the Antarctic Treaty. This is a strategic necess necessity to our nation. Now, Polar Star is the only heavy icebreaker in the United States fleet capable of conducting this mission and providing global access to ice-covered polar regions. In fact, the necessity of global access just played out last week. For 26 stranded crew members on the New Zealand fishing vessel Antarctic Chieftain, a vessel that became stranded in Antarctic ice, Polar Star steamed 900 miles and then broke into 150 miles of ice to save the fishing vessel and its crew as winter begins to set in again in the Antarctic. So ponder that for a minute. What a truly spectacular rescue. But what would happen if we weren't there? What concerns me even more is the United States has no rescue capability whatsoever should that had been Polar Star, who suffered a catastrophic casualty and became beset in ice. We have no rescue for the rescuer. And that does cause me great concern. In the Arctic, I am keenly following the significant spike in human activity attributed to climate change. In fact, it was warmer in Barrow, Alaska last week than it was here in Washington, D.C. Last summer, we had to divert Coast Guard Cutter Healy, the United States' only medium icebreaker, to rescue a 36-foot sailing vessel trapped in ice 40 miles north of Barrow, Alaska. Yes, human activity is taking to the Arctic in ways unthinkable just a few years ago. In fact, a 1,000-passenger cruise ship is planning to transit the Arctic, the Northwest Passage, in 2016. The Arctic, which 5% of which has been charted to modern day standards. And beyond exploration and ecotourism, there is interest in the natural resources that reside in the Arctic. 
that are becoming more exploitable by changing ice patterns. It's predicted that 30% of the world's natural gas, 13% of the world's oil, and over a trillion dollars worth of minerals reside on the sea floor and below in the Arctic region. And two weeks ago, Shell Oil announced its intent to drill later this year. So consider this. While the United States has two ocean-going icebreakers, Russia has a fleet of 27. Russia has one-eighth the gross domestic product of the United States. Clearly, the Arctic is a priority for Russia. Unimpeded access and sustained presence while operating in the Arctic are vital to meet the United States Arctic strategy. There's a new ocean opening. And Coast Guard authorities mandate our presence wherever U.S. national interests require people and ships to operate. This is not a Coast Guard unique challenge. It's a global access challenge that requires a national solution. The funding to recapitalize our ice-breaking fleet must be in addition to our overall acquisition budget while preserving our acquisition programs of record for the offshore patrol cutter and our fleet of fast response cutters, among others. The safety and security of the United States maritime interests depend upon it. Again, I look forward to working with the administration and Congress to find a solution across whole of government to meet national objectives in the polar regions. And accordingly, the Coast Guard will do the following. I will continue to advocate for national icebreaking capability to ensure access to polar regions. Second, I will continue to support and advocate for United States accession to the Law of the Sea Convention. Third, I will invest in partnerships to include Arctic nations to ensure effective governance and to support chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Next month, we will host all Arctic nation partners here in this building, including Russia, for the next round to, to, to establish a Coast Guard Arctic Forum as we look at the challenges we face in the Arctic today. They're humanitarian, they're tribal, they're natural resources. We do not need to militarize the Arctic, and we have an opportunity now to get this right. And I especially want to congratulate our former Commandant, Admiral Bob Papp, and his new role as our special representative to the Arctic. I look forward to working with Bob in support of his efforts as he chairs the Arctic Council on behalf of the United States for these next two years. Now, I began by talking about people, and I want to close today about talking about my duty to our people. Coast Guard operations today are intelligence-based. They're high-tech, they're fast-moving. Marine safety inspectors, cyber professionals, intelligence analysts, financial managers, product line engineers, and the high-tech operators we need to maximize and exploit the full capabilities of our newest platform require specialized, specialized expertise. So we must invest in a 21st century workforce as well. And you may ask yourself, well, what is a 21st century workforce? Well, let me tell you. It's one that's comprised of diverse ideas, perspectives, talents, and cultures. It reflects the population that we serve. And it draws upon the best talent wherever it may be in these United States of America. It's comprised of well-trained, proficient leaders who serve the Coast Guard and the communities in which we live. live. Yes, this is an all-star team. I'm just delighted that I get to be the coach. Our greatest allies in this important effort are the many affinity groups working to bring and retain talented people to our team. I look forward to continuing my relationship with the National Naval Officers Association, the Association of Naval Service Officers, and the Sea Service Leadership Association, who are at the forefront of diversity leadership. To invest in a 21st century workforce, the Coast Guard is going to do the following. First, we will compete a complete a human capital plan that will provide guiding principles to enable our human resource directorate to build an adaptive, a specialized, and diverse 
21st century workforce. Trust me, there's a lot of work that goes with this. Second, we will revise and refresh our diversity and inclusion strategic plan. Third, we will review our civilian career management process to eliminate barriers and improve upward mobility for our civilian workforce. And finally, we will build proficiency by continuing to specialize within our officer and our enlisted ranks. And we will extend tour lengths as we've already done where it makes sense. The Coast Guard's 21st century workforce requires a human resource system that attracts, it includes, and it retains diverse people who can lead and operate in an uncertain and, un and complex environment against sophisticated adversaries. And yes, I am confident that this all-star team of Coasties will win each and every day. Now, as I said earlier, the thought of an icebreaker beset in ice causes me great concern. But the issue that causes me even greatest concern and unrest as Commandant is sexual assault in our Coast Guard. Now, when I interviewed with Secretary Johnson and then following on with, with President Obama to take this position, I was asked to articulate my top priorities. I've stated from the start that the Coast Guard must inspire public trust. That begins with eliminating the scourge of sexual assault from our ranks. All 88,000 Coast Guard men and women must stand together with me and collectively say, not in my Coast Guard. Regrettably, in 2014, 254 Coast Guard members reported a sexual assault. 254 members of our force, our all-star team, our family. They have names, they have faces, and many of those reports involve a fellow Coast Guard member. Make no mistake, the crime of sexual assault is abhorrent to our core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty. Now I commend the 254 members who reported those crimes, who had the courage to stand tall and push back. Now if you have been sexually assaulted, you can be assured that you will be treated with utmost respect and you will be offered the help that you need. Our core values demand it, the law directs it. We will rid our service of sexual assault through the following measures. First, we'll reinforce a culture of respect that is inhospitable to sexual assault and the behaviors that enable it, such as hazing, harassment, and other predatory conduct. Second, we will update our plan of actions and milestones based on a year-long analysis of our organizational culture and the detailed results of the RAND Military Workplace Survey. We will continue to encourage and support sexual assault reporting and provide timely, coordinated resources to our victims. And most importantly, together we will say, not in my Coast Guard. Finally, for nearly 225 years, Coast Guard men and women, our extraordinary people, have been the model for efficient, affordable, and accountable government. It is how we earn public trust. It is our people who were the first among all military branches to achieve a clean, unqualified financial audit opinion. And we've done it now two years in a row. It's our people like those in our Directorate of Operational Logistics, the 5th Coast Guard District, Base Portsmouth, and Sector Hampton Roads, who are conducting a field-level evaluation of business practices that will provide us an even better return on investment. It is our people who are tackling these emerging 21st century challenges while continuing to perform our day-to-day -day missions as we have for nearly 225 years. Yes, it's our people who are operating 40, 50, and even 60-year-old ships, platforms designed with 1960s technology that are underway today, 
piecing together intelligence, acting on tactical data, and launching our helicopter interdiction squadrons from ships designed to conduct coastal search and rescue. Trust me, narco shippers do not want to be found. It is our people who have won five federal acquisition awards in 2014. This is a remarkable achievement that indicates the strength of our acquisition workforce and our acquisition program. It is our people who are applying strategy to budget to best inform our congressional oversight and partners of our plans to best use the limited assets that we have been allocated. Investing in 21st century Coast Guard platforms and people is a smart choice. No one will return more operational value on every dollar than the 88,000 men and women of the Coast Guard, just as Commodore Burtop proved 100 years ago. Now, I have been blessed to lead a forward-leaning, a bias for action, service before self, and proficient workforce, our active, our reserve, our civilian, and our auxiliary. Yes, I do so at a time when our current budget, if enacted, takes the Coast Guard below our post-sequestration funding level of 2013. In some ways, it is a path to the dull knife that is already apparent in the gradual decay of some of our legacy assets, despite the heroic efforts of our support professionals who squeeze every milligram of operational effectiveness out of these platforms. With a strategy-driven budget, a global array of maritime authorities, and a gold standard acquisition program, we have all the navigational tools at hand to, ch to chart a smart investment strategy for the Coast Guard well into the 21st century. And I am confident that the next generation of Coast Guard men and women, as well as the Commandant 100 years from now, will look back upon today's strategic focus and say, we are always ready because our predecessors got it right in 2015. God bless the Coast Guard men and women standing the watch on all seven continents today. God bless America. God bless the United States of America. Thank you and Semper Paratus.